The reason I like baking so much is the actual physical work. I really like to work. Baking's real simple uh, in regards to the ingredients that are in it. It's just flour, water, salt, and yeast generally. The mystery of making a loaf of bread is not a mystery. It's very scientific. There are reference points that define what brioche is, and there's reference points that define what ciabatta is or French bread, and it's often the percentage of hydration or the percentage of sugar or the percentage of fat. Most consumers wouldn't notice the difference between 97% white flour and 3% whole wheat versus 98 versus 2%. But every 5% of different wheats that you put in to equal that 100 make a very different bread. The type of baking we do is pretty internationally accepted. The rules of baking are, are like laws of physics. The actual science behind baking, if it isn't there, you can really see it in the loaf of bread. And then it doesn't interest me a whole lot to eat. I do buy bread in the grocery store because I like to go straighten out the shelves in the afternoon and whatever and, and try to show other customers by buying a big bag of bread, you know, guerrilla marketing. It took me four or five years of every day, 20 hours a day, for me to feel comfortable that I could really deal with whatever you give me, I can make great bread. So experiencing all the different things that can happen in a bakery is a necessity in order to call yourself a baker. Artisan is a choice that I made to call my bakery 15 years ago, and I read the word in a Carol Fields book, Italian Baking, and she described an artisan baker as somebody that has skills with the, their medium, which would be flour, water, salt, and yeast, and, and primarily works with their hands. I wouldn't call myself a baker when I opened this bakery, but that's what I was striving to be. You know, 15 years later, the word artisan, it's a dangerous word. It doesn't necessarily define what I read in Carol Fields' book. It's become a word that has very little meaning, you know, as far as, you know, very large industrial bakeries are calling their bread artisan. I'm not anti-industrial, by the way. There are companies out there that are making very similar product to what I'm making here in this bakery, which is primarily a hand shop. I'm not angry at those people so much. I am angry at the ones that call themselves artisan and aren't even replicating what we do. Slicing you know, the end of the loaf of bread and then cutting what you need and then putting that end of the bread back and then wrapping up the, the end of the brown bag or white bag that you have it in. But the old bread box that used to be in everybody's house up to 30 years ago or so, those things work incredibly well. Um, putting something in plastic and keeping in the refrigerator is actually kind of a weird phenomenon because it makes you seem like it's staying fresh, but actually expedites some of the uh, bacteria. What I tell people that buy a loaf of bread who say, oh, I can't eat that all in a day, is to have it sliced and put it in a plastic bag and freeze it. And then you can just drop the pieces of bread into your toaster and not even toast it if you don't want to toast it, but just defrost it and then uh, it turns out great. The most simplest way of saying it is the more water you add potentially can mean bigger holes, but it also is, depends on how much you ferment it and what strength your flour is and how much mixing or development you do. The ciabatta type of bread with large holes has a large amount of water. I can make that same bread with the same hydration percent by handling it completely different and it wouldn't have those holes at all. But it also has a lot to do with being gentle. Fifteen years ago, machines weren't gentle enough to make really high quality ciabatta. Now they're more gentle than many people's hands. And so they can keep that whole structure inside without the machine crushing and working. Because really, anytime you touch dough, I mean, just, just touching it, there's this amazing complexity of uh, gluten that's just been kicked and it, it, it reacts and develops strength. So, you know, the trick to big holes is really doing as little to that dough as possible through the fermentation process and uh, adding a lot of water. That book really irritates me, the no need to need. You know, I kind of think I know all the top bakers in this country and a lot of them from all over the world. So whenever there's a book that comes out that I've never heard or met the person, I'm like, a little nervous. The problem with any of those books, and I, I'm not picking on that particular book, but there's a lot of bread books out there, especially with a real strong titles like, a, you know, Apprentice or Bible. Um, these are words to me that are strong words, like Artisan once was. I do believe in no need to need, but it's explained in a, in a scientific uh, way other than the way that book was written. 
chemicals. Usually I taste uh, burning sensations and uh, my esophagus is uh, kind of on fire. <laughs> well, preservatives are a funny word. There's uh, natural preservatives like raisin concentrate or vinegar. And then there are man-made preservatives. So I do make products that have four or five, six day shelf life that are sliced and in plastic bags and they'll have preservatives in them, but they're all natural preservatives. A lot of the convenience stores, their focus is uh, to be able to have a product they're able to store for many weeks, which is pretty close to impossible with something with moisture uh, in the food world without something really strong in there to keep it from, you know, chemical, to keep from, uh, bacteria and mold from getting active. Temperature is key. So if your house is not temperature controlled and you are dealing with whatever the temperature is outside, then yeah, the weather can affect you greatly. Generally, you'll buy an ounce package or something of yeast at a, at a grocery store. That ounce of yeast, for me, would make 100 pounds of bread. For most home bakers, they're used to dumping that whole packet into their dough. So I teach them how little yeast you really need to make a really great loaf of bread. I know my starter, it gets fed and it's taken care of very well, but a home baker starter, if it's been kept in a refrigerator for a week without being fed, it's not gonna react anything like my starter. So it's a very difficult subject to teach a home baker. They really need to master the taking care of the starter part before they even get to the baking part. A starter is a, gener is a, a general term for many, many different pre-ferments and they can be yeasted preferments or wild cultured preferments. Starter and preferment are synonymous. Is that the right word? We either make starters or we feed the starters. Okay. So the yeasted ones are made from scratch. And these were made 24 hours ago and being used right this minute. What we look for is that nice laciness. Can you see that? That's kind of uh, the maximum. We don't go any further than that. So we'll put in, you know, a percentage of this into our final dough and this will provide us strength, development, because we're not going to mix for a long time. Um, and the sourdough one is taking a piece of the culture and inoculating it with flour and water and letting that grow. And we always make enough that we can keep a piece of this so the next day we can feed it and make more. The gold miners would keep this in <clears throat> something like this in a pouch and keep it on their body to, and then they would feed it and, and raise bread with it. This is alive and uh, it's no different really than a puppy or your child or whatever. If you don't feed it, it dies.